All right, so this is the introduction to game development, and I am assuming that everyone doesn't know anything about game development, so I'm starting from scratch. If you know anything, you probably know more than me. So, <laughs> um, so my name is Alex Critchfield. Um, maybe two and a half years ago, I decided I wanted to make games, and so I started making games. Um, I'm a hobbyist because I haven't been paid yet for anything but I haven't really tried to make money off of it, so it, that's where it is. Um, that address is my live stream where I very irregularly stream while I develop games and also occasionally play Hearthstone. And, um, all, but also on that page mainly is a link to a bunch of my past projects and the ones that I'm going to show here. And we're actually currently live here. I'm just not talking anymore. So our goals are an introduction to game development in general, um, an overview of the Stencil game engine, and I will go over game engines in a little bit more detail when we get to that section. And at the end, we're going to use the Stencil game engine to make a project. Um, and then at the end of the class, it'll be a full game. It won't be a good game, but it'll be a game. And that's pretty much all you can hope for most of the time. <coughs> So what this class isn't about is how to get into the games industry, because I don't know. Um, supposedly, you make mods. That's the, from what I heard, is you make really awesome mods, and then the, the, the developer, the studio who makes the games will notice you and then invite you on to their next project. And that's happened a lot of times. Um, DayZ, uh, there are a huge Skyrim mod. Um, I assume that the guys who make XCOM Long War are going to be invited because it's awesome. So basically, take an existing popular game with modding tools, make an awesome mod, and get popular, and that's, a, that's your in, really. Um, the other alternative is you go to school for it. And, you, know, you don't know about school. And I don't know how to make money with games. Um, everything that I read about the independent games industry is that you're better off buying lottery tickets. Um, because everyone wants to make games to make money because it's kind of easy, really. Um, and they want to make lots of money, like, you know, that guy who made Minecraft. Uh, that's a moonshot, that's a one in a million, that, that, that's literally has happened once in the history of gaming. And so there's, I don't know about that. You're going to have to ask someone else. Okay. So my name is Alex Critchfield. I've been in the software industry, put quotes around everything I say. For about 20 years, um, I've held positions as a tester, programmer, customer support, managing projects. I've been gaming since I could hold a joystick. Uh, my uncle, Jakob Appleboy, he developed and published Devilator for the Atari, not the Atari 2600, the Atari 800, that's last one. The Atari 800 was the, uh, was the computer version of uh, that Atari put out with the 2600. And that actually had a keyboard and its operating system was, I think, uh, some form of basic. And, Atari Basic. Yeah. And so he wrote that game in, in either Atari Basic or, or Atari Assembly language. I, I don't know. I don't know what he wrote it in. Um, but he actually published a game. So he was kind of my, my inspiration for that. What's funny is I was trying to introduce some more modern type game development with a more modern engine. And so I was saying, we're going to remake Dem Devilator in Unity. And so I, I made an elevator, made it move. It's like, now where do you write the code that erases it from the screen and then puts it back on again? Because that's how they had to do it, pixel by pixel, every time. And so things have come a long way, it's much easier. Um, so I've been a hobbyist game developer for little, I guess, two and a quarter years now, maybe a little bit more. All right. So let me show you my Pokemans. These are the things that, this is, um, this is a screenshot from Devilator that my uncle made for the Atari. Um, it had a punishingly harsh difficulty in that it was actually really innovative for its time. It had this, he made different, because you can only use, uh, I think, four colors, um, or five colors, I don't know how many. But he made the, his sprites different by having a different head and body on, on a bunch of them, and that's how he made different looking sprites. Um, the harsh difficulty that he put in was that you had to align that elevator with pixel perfect accuracy to get the guys on and off. And it wouldn't tell you when you weren't aligned, other than the guys wouldn't move on and off. So that unnecessary difficulty, I think, kept the game from being too accessible. Um, but the, the idea of the game is that you were an elevator operator. Uh, 
people wanted to go to different floors of the building. If the queue filled up all the way to the end, you, lo you lost your life. There was a little box at the top. Um, there were, and in addition to the regular guys, there were all sorts of weird, weird people. Like, uh, like there was like a gigantic fat person who took up two spaces in the elevator. Um, there was guys, guys carrying a stretcher that took up three spaces. Um, there was a guy with a bomb that if you didn't deliver him on time, he'd blow up your elevator. Um, and, then, and then I think there was, and then the difficulty ramp, ramped up with someone asking to go to the seventh floor. Well, there's no seventh floor, so he just took up a spot in your elevator forever. Um, so it, it was actually pretty innovative for its time. It just, I don't think it did very well. Because that there just wasn't that big a market there. So this is the very first um, solo project that I made. It's called Solo World Builder, and it's a uh, one-person Scrabble game. Um, I made it in the Unity game engine, which is a 3D engine. This is fundamentally a 2D project, but I wanted to learn the 3D anyway. So I didn't use any of the 2D GUI elements. Um, I learned about using external resources. I learned about 3D modeling. So there was a lot of uh, there was a, there was a lot a lot of stuff to learn for this project, and probably it was actually a bit too much for a, for a first project. I, th I think a simple action game would be a better choice. You said you've been doing this for about two years. Two and a half ish. Yeah. Let me let me get a, a better gauge here. How many hours a day per week? Uh, <laughs> my free time. Eight hours uh, a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, not 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 nearly that much. Um, Six. <laughs> my. Nowadays, if you my Twitch stream when I start developing, um, I have a set of development goals that I think is going to take four hours to do six hours, and I finish them in an hour live, and then I put it away because I don't have anything else to do. So in the beginning, it will take longer for you to ramp up, and and you will have eight-hour days, and and I'll I'll get to this a little bit later, but there's a big difference between making a game and making a product, um, and so that's when you make your product, that's when you have to put in your hours. So the next one that I that I made was this is kind of a proof of concept because I really like roguelike games. Uh, NetHack's one of my favorite games, and so I wanted to make a game that was a roguelike but hexagon based. And so I realized that hexagon coordinate systems are not particularly fun to work with. Um, and so that's why the, this thing is skewed because I, my hexagon coordinate system is working, but I couldn't really figure out how to make it a square. So, but I, I got it. I got it working as much as I wanted it to work, and for a proof of concept, um, that that was that was fine for me. So you're 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 the little blue dot right there. Um, you have to go. These are the stairs. You have to go down the stairs, get the ID card, go back up the stairs. If one of the red dots gets next to you and you move next to him, they'll hit you, lower your health. If your health goes to zero, you lose. You can pick up food. The food does nothing. I didn't. I didn't actually implement that. Um, but you can pick up the ID card, you go up, and then the screen says you win. So that, that was my other project there. So that, after that, I decided to take on something ambitious. Um, so this is a game that I called Silent Tactics. I wanted it to be a tactical, card-based game. Uh, it was way too complicated for my level of skill. I got decently far in it, um, but there was just too much. Making something like this requires so much content, so much playtesting, and so it's, it's really, really easy when you get first getting started to bite up more than you can, you can chew. It's, it's so easy. Um, to be really ambitious, have all these big dreams, and, and then you start working on it, and you realize, I've worked on this for 600 hours, and it's crap. And then, and then, and then sometimes it's okay to put it away. Because I looked at the code of this, and I realized that I can still use it if I want to. So it's, it's not a bad idea when you're learning to work on something ambitious and put it away. But if you want to finish something, make it small. Um, this is one of the small ones that I finished. It's called uh, Gasteroid. It's based on asteroids, but instead, you shoot the asteroid, it makes a gas cloud, and then you have to navigate your ship into that cloud to get points. But if you shoot the cloud, it catches on fire and, and kills you. Um, so you can't shoot while you're in the clouds. That's kind of a challenge. Um, I wrote the physics of it, the moving your ship around from scratch. You can't see it on the screenshot, but the, um, the neat thing that I did was that you could see the thrusters of your ship as you move different directions. Um, and I tried to try to keep it all very simple, and I finished it in maybe maybe two weeks, I guess. So this is a little bit bigger project I work on. This is also in 3D. Um, the idea of it is a 
it's like crossbows and a cross between crossbows and catapults in golf. And your goal is to knock down that wall and hit the king who's behind that wall. Um, every time your puck hits the wall, it damages the wall. You can see the wall damage by the different colors. It has very light RPG elements. The warrior puck does the most damage. The wizard puck does an area of effect explosion. The priest puck lowers the cooldown because people because the pucks can't shoot when their cooldown's up. And the rogue puck is the only one who can sit behind the castle. Everyone else resets when they get in the castle. So that was fun. Um, I learned a decent amount about Unity Physics and realized that it was crappy. Uh, I could not figure out how to get those blocks to stop jittering. They always were vibrating, and that's apparently a very common problem with stacked objects. So if you notice physics in games, you don't see a lot of objects stacked on, one, on top, one on top of the other, because that, that causes problems for a lot of physics engines. But it was fun and it was a good learning experience. Um, so this is probably my most polished, finished product. It's called uh, Valence, and it's a remake of the uh, Atari game, uh, what is it, Atoms Fashion. And so the idea is that you're a ship flying around atoms, you want to shoot the electrons off, and then that blows up the nucleus, then you collect the particles that come out. And so I, I, it's basically a direct remake. Um, I realize I'm really bad at making UI. This UI design was given to me by a forum member that I'm on that felt sorry for me <laughs> for, for my game looking really bad. Um, but but it worked. Everything. This this is the closest that I came to a real product. And and there's a big difference between making a product and making a game. You can make a game in a couple hours. Um, but if you want something to produce, it has to be polished. There's a lot of stuff that goes around it. There's your installer. Um, you have to worry about clearing all of your assets, making sure that you don't accidentally use something that's copyrighted. Uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And then after you do all that, then there's the business side, um, figuring out how to sell your product. And so that's the step that I never took with this one. Is, is, it was just it was too much for me. Um, but the game itself looked pretty cool. Uh, so this is one that I made for Ludum Dare 28, I think, in December of this year. It's called uh, iGun. And the, it was all done entirely, entirely by me. The graphics were done in MS Paint uh, with a light glow added by the sprite editor of Game Maker. And the idea is that you're a cyclops who has your arms and legs chopped off. But you have a magical artifact that you fling your eyeball and use it as a grappling hook. <laughs> and so you use that to solve puzzles on the levels to get to the exits. Um, and so that, that was made by me in, I guess, a total of maybe 14 hours of work. And I could have put more work into it because the deadline wasn't up yet. But after working 14 hours straight, you know, I needed a break, so I just submitted it as was. This was a proof of concept called a uh, battle snake, and so it took the traditional snake game and added kind of a uh, actiony aspect to it, where your snake gets bigger um, as you eat things, but those guys, the triangles are your enemies; they can shoot you, and if they shoot you, your snake gets smaller, and if the, your snake gets too small, you lose. So you can shoot them within the radius of that circle, and as your snake gets bigger, that circle gets bigger. So it kind of has this scaling difficulty thing where. As your snake gets bigger, you can shoot further, but it also gets easier for you to beat it. This was the first. This was in the Game Maker engine, um, and this was the first time that I experimented with drawing objects directly on the screen. So the, the health bars and, and the shooting radius is is drawn in game. It's it's not a sprite that's preloaded. So that that was a pretty good experience. This one was designed by my four year old daughter. She said, I want an ice cream cone that does cartwheels in a house, and I want it to pop balloons. And so I realized that she's a much better game designer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> All of the art here was taken from a clip art site. This was, uh, I, think, I think the bottom was a, uh, I think it was a grass field that I colored blue to make it look like shag carpet. And this was, this was done in Unity, and it's entirely in 2D, but um, this is before Unity had uh, it had 2D tools, now it has 3D tools. Or, now, it was all entirely 3D, but now Unity has tools to make 2D games much easier. Um, this was my first game in the Stenson game engine. It's very straightforward. You've got to walk around the, around the desert. When the light turns green, you dig. Don't get hit by the spiders. You get 20 treasures, you win. Um, and then, 
This is the one that I'm currently working on, that screenshot sucks. Uh, it's called Pure Smash. The idea is that it's a battlefield game like I'd, anyone play Smash TV? Total Carnage? I mean, too old? <laughs> okay. Um, but the idea is that you're a, guy, you're a little guy on the screen then waves of enemies come at you. And in Smash TV you shoot them down. In this one, you can't shoot, but you can dash. And when you dash, you run through the enemies, make them bounce off you. And that's how you hurt enemies, is that when they bounce off you, they hit each other, and that's how they die. So you can't, the idea of the game is that you can't attack enemies directly. So, all right, so that's enough of me showing you my Pokemons. Um, the fundamental truth about developing video games is that they're a software product. They're no different than any other software product, and you don't need to think of them any differently just because they're shinier. Um, all of the principles that apply to a, 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 any other software product apply to a game. Uh, your version control, your commenting, uh, meaningful variables, um, just all of the standards that, that apply to other programming apply to games. Documentation. Yeah, documentation. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, design document, design document. That, that's. I only started a couple of those projects with a design document, and really, you really should start every project with a design document. Um, because if you don't, then things will pop up into your head that you want, and you'll never actually get anywhere. You'll just keep futzing around with things, because you don't know where you're going. And I'll, at some point, I'll break up an example of a, of a design document. You can just Google game design document to get some good examples. Um, so, what is a game engine? So it's a tool used, that's a dictionary definition here. Um, it's just a framework that lets you, makes it easier for you to develop games. There's no reason that you can't um, go use raw C or even assembly language to make your games. It's just the game engine makes it easier for you. Okay, so the components of a game engine. Um, game engines usually have a compiler that will take your uh, code and put it out to your desired deployment platform. Uh, they'll usually have an asset library. That's where you store your things like your sound and your music and, and all that stuff. They'll usually have a code editor, code editor some kind of a, a code IDE that will do auto-completion. Um, they'll almost always have a test environment where you can test your test your your uh, um, your creation while it's being made. They'll have something called a scene preview or room preview, which will let you visually edit um, the areas of your game, the screens of your game, and we'll get more into that a little bit later. And a lot of them come with uh, asset tools uh, like an image editor, sound editor, and online asset resources. Um, one of the big pulls of the Unity engine is that it has this huge online store of assets that can let someone with no art experience or, or no programming experience even make a relatively professional looking game by shelling out a little bit of money, not much really. So this is the, the big slide, it has the parts of the game. So the, the big parts of the game are the scenes and sometimes they're called rooms. And you could think of them like, like a diorama, uh, like a shoebox diorama, where you have your box and you put, you have a, a paper in the back that's your background. You put the things in there that you want, to, that you want, and then um, so you're you're building this puppet show for the player, and the strings on your guys are your program code. Uh, the views, the and cameras are another aspect of a game. Uh, so, in addition to the box, the scenes, you actually have what the player sees in it. If you think about something like Mario Brothers, um, you have a, this really long level, and the player only sees a small part of it, and the camera moves with the, uh, with the guy. And so you have to, you have to build those views. They're not, they don't, they're not happening automatically. Um, when you're talking in 3D space, there's two, there's two kinds of cameras that, that you're dealing with one is called an orthographic projection, where, um, sorry, one, one is called orthographic, um, where no matter how far away on away from the camera the object is, it's going to stay the same size when it's rendered to the screen. And the other um, is projection type camera, where it's actually the 3D view. It's like it's like your eyes, where you get your perspective, where as an object further from you, it appears to be smaller. 
Uh, so that's a big decision to make. And most of the time when you do 2D stuff in a 3D space, you're using your orthographic camera. Um, so it, inside the scenes, you'll have your game objects. And it'll, I'm sorry, you'll have your instances of your game objects. And game objects are containers for code, graphics, physics. Engines have different ways of naming game objects. Uh, some call them game objects. Stencil calls it actors. Uh, but a, a pretty much every engine will have just a way to um, package up something that's in a game that, that either the player interacts with or does something on the screen. Um, the instances and the scenes are what respond to events. And we'll, we'll get to events a little bit later. Uh, so then you have your graphics. Um, in 2D, the graphics are called sprites. And um, in 3D, they're called models. And anyone here do any 3D modeling? Nope. Okay. I say stick with 2D games. <laughs> because 3D is a big, big can of worms to open up with. Um, and and that's, that's something that I tried to do when I first started out. And I feel like I, I shouldn't have tried to do both at the same time. I think that's slowed me down a lot. Um, 3D modeling is a is a, a profession in itself. There's a lot to it. If you want to make 3D, just being able to do 3D and making it look good or different. Um, I can open up MS Paint. I can open up Inkscape and produce adequate uh, 2D stuff. Um, but 3D is beyond my capability. I, I don't know. Maybe you guys are more talented at, at it than I am. But I, I'd recommend sticking to 2D for at least when you first start out. Um, your sound and your music. Sound's one of those things that I, I never want to do when I'm making a game. You have to do it, but it's just so, it's such like a mundane thing where there you're listening to, you go to a sound library, you listen to a whole bunch of sounds, you find one that's CC0 or CC attribution, and then you edit it in the sound editor. And it's a really a rote process that, that's very straightforward. Um, and so I always save it for last. Then you have your visual effects. Um, one of the main visual effects you'll see in modern games called particles, where a particle is a is a drawing, usually a repeated drawing that makes a pattern that, that can simulate a um, or either a real world uh, effect or something that that you you want to highlight, like. Like if you have a glowy sword that shoots sparks, the sparks will generally be particles. Um, or if you have a torch that, that makes puffs of smoke, the smoke will probably be particles. Because, uh, and the reason that, that a lot of engines use particles is because they're a very lightweight way to um, make impressive graphical effects. So in addition to particles, there's programmatic animation where you and your program say that every frame your guy grows by six pixels. And, and so that, that's another way to do visual effects. And that's actually how you have to do all the visual effects um, in, on engines that don't have particle systems. Stencil does not have particle systems, so all of the effects are programmatic. Then you have your code, um, and then you have your external data resources, your dictionaries, like for my Scrabble game, I need a dictionary of valid words, so that's an external text file. Um, my unit stats for my Cyborg Tactics game, those are XML files. And then any external resource that you have, let's say you have a big intro movie that you don't want to include in every game, you could add it streaming. Um, and then the final part would be your UI, your GUI, your controls. So, find the cursor here. So this is how you get started. Um, download a game engine. You just go to Google, type in game engine, you'll find one. Uh, search for tutorials, complete them, and repeat until you're comfortable with the engine UI. That's the really the main thing that the tutorials do for you because these, these game engines, they're, they're big products. They, they have a lot to them. They're like, and walking into it, it's, it's a, lim a little bit intimidating to see all these options. And that's what the tutorials do is that they they have this subset of options that, that let you get familiar with it. Um, I, I read and went through a couple of books on different engines, one on GameMaker, one on Unity, that helped me. Problem with books, out of date. 
they're almost always out of date. They're almost always not applicable to the current version of the engine. Uh, but there actually is one good thing about that. Um, the good thing about that is if something doesn't work, like it says in the book, you have to research why it doesn't work. And you have to learn more about the engine uh, to make it work. And so that's actually might not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, so pick a tiny, tiny project as your first project, the smallest thing you can think of. Uh, Pong, Asteroids, Space Invaders. Asteroids is kind of the, uh, in, in the, from what I was reading, Asteroids is kind of the go-to project when someone's learning a new engine. Um, Space Invaders and make it end-to-end -end a product. Have an intro screen, have a gameplay screen, have a finish screen. That's a game. And poof, you're a game developer. That's all you need. All right. So let's see here. Um, we're kind of an appendix where to get resources. I'm not an artist. I don't draw very well. Uh, these are sites that you can use to get some resources. Open Game Art is excellent. There's tons of resources. Almost all of them are either CC0 or CC Attribution. So you can use them in a commercial product, and all you have to do is, depending on, depending on the exact license, um, you just have to give the author a nod. Uh, you don't need permissions. Uh, freesound.org is so far the best repository of sound effects that I've seen. Uh, Gameicons.net has a, a ton of icons. Um, if you guys played World of Warcraft, they, they a lot of the icons there. They're modeled after those, so they're very straightforward a way to give the player information. All right, so that's it for the talky part. So let's uh, go ahead and make a game. Um, any questions? So far? Good. All right. You know, let me get back to, there's something that I missed that I should probably uh, talk about. Um, so different game engines. Um, so I've worked with four game engines so far. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Um, Unity is the most common one that you'll see, you'll hear talked about a lot in the independent gaming circles. Uh, Full-fledged 3D engine. Uh, you can make pretty much anything that you can think of with it. It's, it's meant really, there's a lot of accessibility in it where they make it easier, easy for you to do things. It feels like it was a bit easier when I first started than the, than the latest versions. There, there's been a little bit of a feature bloat on it, but it's still, the nice thing about it is they, they grandfather in all the legacy systems, so you can still drop back to an older version. Um, and the newest version of Unity has 2D capabilities. So you can, you can work in pure 2D, even though, even though it's a 3D environment, you'll, you'll move things around in 3D space. Um, they'll interact with each other in 2D space. And, and here's the weirdness is, they have both a 2D physics engine and a 3D physics engine, and apparently both can be active at the same time. And I don't know how that's supposed to work, but that's, <laughs> that's there. Uh, maybe you'll come up with an innovative game concept that uses physics in both 2D and 3D, I don't know. Um, stencil, this engine is Stencil. Um, it is made to be accessible. Let's see if I find a cursor. The draw of Stencil is that... Is that you can make code, you can program without syntax. Not without logic, but without syntax. So here's an example of code. Um, these are building blocks. You get them from this palette here. And so I'm going to add an if statement to my created. I just go here, I do if, and then if something equals something, then execute what's inside this block. It's very, uh, it's very straightforward. There's no syntax, and I I've been programming enough that I know syntax. I'm not a great programmer, but I know how to do syntax. And I still like this the best out of all of it. I, I think games programming doesn't, doesn't necessarily need very complicated programming. And this is a really great way to, to get it working. Um, so that, that's why I like Stencil, and that's the, my engine of choice. And until I run into serious limitations on it, I'm going to keep using it or something better comes up. 
Uh, Game Maker is another engine I used. Um, they are it is Windows only, unfortunately. Um, that's similar to Stencil. There's a visual development environment where you can say, if it collides with this, do this. Um, timers, alarms. Uh, Game Maker is the, the real draw of Game Maker for me is that it has a built in sprite editor. So it makes it very easy to do 2D things and make effects and resize and all those things. All those things that you need to do when you're making a game in 2D space, it makes it very easy to do. And in fact, um, Game, so Game Maker is a commercial product, but if you if you run Windows or you have access to Windows, you want to edit sprites. I download Game Maker just for the sprite editor, not necessarily using the engine, because it's worth it just for that. Um, the other engine that I used is uh, um, JMonkey, and that is an open source uh, 3D game engine. It's Java based. I don't know Java very well, I don't know 3D very well, I didn't get very far in it. But it's there, and it has some very impressive visual effects, if that's what you're trying to do. What was that one called? Uh, J-Monkey. J-Monkey? Yeah. Letter J, word monkey. Uh, and that's, that's, that's free, that's open source. Uh, I don't know of any, I think I know of one commercial product that was made, of, and it's pretty good too. It's, it's called uh, Grappling Hook. But search for J-Monkey first, and then it'll take you there. Uh, I, di I didn't get very far in it. I learned a little bit from it. But you, know, you, you guys might have better results. All right. So, so we're going to make our game from uh, scratch here. Display, so I'm not uh, breaking my neck here. Game class game. All right. So let me go over the parts of the uh, uh, stencil engine. Um, so the first thing that you'll see at the top here, uh, the resources, is the actors. That's what uh, stencil calls game objects. Anything that can be interacted with or, or interact with something else or has code applied to it is an actor. Actors. So let me create one. We're going to call it the hero. So the first thing that you'll see is the appearance, and that's where you add your um, animations. Uh, Stencil uses um, it, it lets you import things called uh, sprite strips, which lets you do animated uh, characters. Um, if you go to Open game art. You can search for animated sprites. You'll see that there'll be a block of gra a block of um, pictures, and then your engine chops up that block, and then each of those pictures is a frame of animation. And I believe stencil runs at 60 frames a second. I'm not sure exactly. So we're going to go ahead and add an, add an animation. So we'll add a frame. In this case, I already pre-made these, so I'm not going to bother with uh, Inkscape. So we're going to add the hero. Okay. He's just a green square. Okay. So in the actors there are things called uh, behaviors. And a behavior is a package of events that can be applied to multiple actors. Um, in this case, we don't have any behaviors that we're going to attach yet. Um, there's events that you directly add things to your actors that aren't in behaviors. 
that's kind of where you prototype some code before you put it into a behavior. Um, generally, you want to put things into behaviors. And the main reason that you want to put things into behaviors instead of um, putting them just on the actor itself is that when code, when this, you can't access attributes that are on the actor itself. You can only access attributes from behaviors. That's a, just a, a quirk of stencil. It, it doesn't change anything. It's just means that you're better off working in behaviors than you are working in, directly on the actor. Um, collision. So collision is something um, that I didn't talk about earlier. And what a player sees on the screen and what a game reacts to isn't necessarily the same thing. Uh, and what a game reacts to is called a collider. So let's an example is that you want to be generous to the player, so you want you want the enemies to miss him more frequently. You make a collider box smaller than the enemy, so that the enemy's first two feet can touch him, but but if the head touches him, then he loses. Um, so you can adjust your collider separately from from your your actors, and that that becomes also important in three D, where you have all sorts of stuff in your modeling that you don't want colliding. So we're going to leave that for now. Physics, turns physics on and off, affected by gravity, yes or no, whether or not they can rotate freely. Um, that means that if they get uh, rotational force, uh, then they'll start spinning. Um, so usually I'm going to turn off rotation for this exercise here. And finally, the properties, that's what, uh, mainly it's which uh, collision group he's in. And we'll, we'll get to that a little, little bit later as we start adding stuff to our actors. Okay, so let's um, go ahead and make our first scene. Let's see if it's time to go away like it from here. Okay. Let's go ahead and make our first uh, scene. So the scene, like I said, is the uh, your, your puppet show, your, your diorama shoebox. So we're going to make a new scene. We're going to call it uh, Game. Um, stencil will give you a tile width. I'm just going to arbitrarily give it a, a gradient between Let's see, between pale blue and white, OK, create. And that'll take us to our scene where we can add tiles. Um, so there's two kinds of backgrounds that you'd use. One is a tile set for making um, a game like Mario or, or um, on more old school type games. Um, the other is a painted um, image background. And you can mix and match them too, because your tiles can actually interact with your actors, whereas the painted background can't. Um, in this case, we're going to go ahead and, and make tiles. So I'm going to add a, uh, and I'm not going to do anything with the scene for now. So I'm, I'm not changing behaviors. Um, all right. So in addition to the actors, the scenes um, can also get events. Uh, they can also get behaviors. But I'm not going to mess with that for now. Um, so let me go ahead and make a tile set. So a tile set is a whole bunch of tiles that you can use to draw your levels. Um, I'm going to make a new tile set. I'm going to call it Dirt. And then we're going to add our image, which is going to be Dirt. OK, great. Now wait till I... OK, as you can see, we have a tile set with one tile in it. Normally, you'd have a lot of different tiles for all the different things that you can add to your level. Uh, but in, in our case, we're keeping it simple. We're just having one tile at a time. OK. So go ahead and change this property. That's fine. So in Stencil, it lets you add individual colliders to tiles, but you can't draw the collider. So that what that will let you do is that it will let you have um, interesting collisions based on your tile graphics. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't draw, draw them on there. You have to pick from a preset set of uh, colliders. So in this case, we're just going to collide with the square. So let's go back to our game, and we're going to add some tiles. Player game. It's not very impressive. It's just dirt at the bottom. 
and let's add our hero. And this is also where you add your uh, your dudes. So um, holding down shift lets you add on the grid. Okay. So I add my dude. And he's floating in the air because I have not um, added any gravity. And we'll see if I can remember where to add gravity. Oops. Gravity vertical down. It says 85 to assume my real world gravity. And I believe our hero is affected by gravity. Yes. Okay. And now he should fall down. Yep, he did. Okay. Good. So now we want to make... Is there a mechanism where you can adjust the gravity so it's not 9.8? Sure. Okay, yeah, right there. Something like yeah. Sure, let's make it, make, make it more fluid. Let's make his gravity 5. Um, then we go to our scene, our game. And let's move him up so that... We move them on the grid. Let's go there. So I, I changed the gravity from 85 to 5. Now he. More footy. Yeah, you, you can arc chain gravity, you can move it entirely. Let's put our boy back on the ground here. Okay, so now we're going to move. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new behavior. So I'm going to make a new actor behavior. And this would be hero move. All right, so we're in our actor behavior. Now, the very first thing when you, you do when you want to make a new behavior is you need to attach it to your actor. And I forget this all the time. I'm wearing like a whole lot of things work. Um, so the very first thing I do before I add any code Hero, behavior, choose behavior, hero move. Okay, great. So now I'll move. So now I'm going to add events. Now the events are um, what makes stuff happen in your game. In this case, I'm going to add the. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm actually going to add this on the. Let me, let me actually go through, go through the whole event bar because I think it's important enough to, to walk through it. Um, so the basics is when creating, it's when an actor is first instantiated on the screen. Um, drawing, drawing is a special event that lets you draw things to the screen. It's the only event where you can access this drawing palette, and the only event where drawing things happen. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example of drawing after this 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 game. Updating. Updating is your next important event that happens every frame. Um, so games usually <coughs> run at maybe 60 frames a second, roughly. So every every one of those frames, all of your everything in your update um, events fires. And then in addition to that, your objects are repositioned based on whatever the code told them. Um, the physics events fire. Collision events fire. Order of operations can become important, uh, so I don't know the exact order of operations for Stencil, it hasn't come up yet, but that's something that you'd want to look up if, if something's not happening the right way that, that you're expecting. Um, updating, and the thing about the updating event is that because it fires every frame, you don't want to be inefficient in it because that'll slow down your game. So input is keyboard, any key, window gets focus. Um, the, these aren't ones that, that I've used too much. Um, time is not a really good one. Um, after n seconds, every n seconds. So after, um, after a certain amount of time to do this, say you want, a, you want a, a bomb on the screen. You want it to explode after a certain amount of time. It's a good place to put it. After n seconds, if the bomb exists, explode. Um, every n seconds means that it fires um, after a certain amount of time. 
and that's a way that you can limit inefficient things. Instead of firing every frame as fast as the game will let it, it'll fire at a fixed rate. And that's what I use with um, the Hero Smash game, I'll show you later, but the zombies in that game, they turn toward your guy, but they don't turn instantly when he moves past them. Instead, they, every maybe fifth of a second, they'll check to see whether the guy moves past, and then they'll turn. So that's I'm keeping the inefficient things from clogging up the game. These events have to do with actors, um, enters or loses a scene, created or dies. Most of the stuff I've been able to get away with just the basics and the timer, um, and then collision. Collision events are also important. So we'll, we'll, we'll actually be building a collision event when we add our bullets. Okay? And the rest of these, uh, the rest of these, the only ones that I've used is the custom event. And the custom event is where you can add functional programming to this whole thing. Where you can build functions that are called by other events. And that, that's, that's pretty important when you're doing anything that's remotely complicated. Um, and then the custom blocks are if you have a whole bunch of code that you just want to reuse between multiple guys. Um, that's not necessarily specific to any one guy. Uh, I use the custom block to calculate a distance formula, for example. And it's a lot of pallet items to calculate the distance formulas. So I don't have to want to have to copy that over. I want to be efficient and only change it one place. So we're on our hero move event. So I'm going to add event. And I'm going to add this on the updating. Okay. So then I'm going to add some blocks. If let's see, user input. Control, and then I select which control I want. Right, and you in, in the um, stencil options you can configure what the default controls are, and you can add new control points. Um, I'm just using the default ones. So if right is down, then I'm going to add a new attribute. So attributes are are what um, what sensible variables. Um, attributes are specific to their context, unless they're game attributes, which are global. Um, in this case, we're in the behavior hero move, so I'm adding an attribute hero speed to hero move. So I'm going to create an attribute. And the type is important. I want a number, and it's arbitrary. I'll call it 10. And the, the idea of behaviors is, is that they're reusable, and you can potentially um, use this movement on a different guy. And the attributes that you don't mark as hidden are visible on the behavior itself uh, when it's attached to your actor. And so I'm not going to make this hidden just to show you how that looks. Oops, did I call it 10? I did, didn't I? <laughs> Whoops. I'm going to add number hero speed. I'm going to make that 10. And so that is not hidden. So what I can do is go to my hero. Okay. All right, I'm close this off. Open it up again. Now, when I click his behavior, there you go. So I can set his speed here on, on the behavior itself, rather than going into the uh, code to set it. where to attach the hero. So if you have hero move on, let's say you have a two-player game, you know, one guy to move 20, one guy to move 10. That's where you'd make this change. They'd be the same movement, they just have a different value. Where this bites me sometimes is I forget that I set it public, and I set the value um, on the behavior, on, on the outside of it. And I have a different value on the inside that I'm expecting to work, and it doesn't. And so that, that can be a little bit difficult to debug. So generally, I keep stuff hidden unless I have a really good reason for not having it hidden. So let me go to my uh, move, and we are going to make this hidden. Okay. So if right is down, 
Now I'm going to add a motion property. So X speed. So to select an attribute, here is speed, for self. Um, so the stencil coordinate system starts in the upper left hand corner. So it's zero, zero in the upper left hand corner, and then goes down into the right. So if you if um, if so positive values go down the screen, positive values go right on the screen. And then I'm going to duplicate this block. Okay. Duplicate the block. All right, mouse. Back of this. If, actually, I'm going to change that to otherwise. So what I'm doing is I'm making my guy move left and right. Otherwise, if left is down, change it to negate your speed. Or you can multiply by negative one, or however you want to do it. And then otherwise, I want him to stop when we let go of our controls, so he's not going to have any momentum. Okay. So, hopefully, this makes our guy move. There he goes. There he goes. He's a little bit slow. Okay. I'm probably going to make him a little bit faster. But look, I can take him off the screen. He's gone. He's gone. I can't get him back. So that's something that, uh, that we're going to add. Okay, so he's a little bit slow. We're going to change his speed and his attributes to the speed. We're going to make that 20. That's really good. Okay. So now we're going to do the fun part of um, all the logic that you need to do to make a game here. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to keep him from going off the screen. So this is going to be move. Oops. And we're going to add event. And updating. We're going to call that stay on screen. two if statements. So if his position, and you can see in the flow it has all of these, um, all of the logic that, that you use. So if his position is less than zero, Then I reset his position. Set x to zero. So that should keep him from moving off the left side of the screen. And I'm going to do the same thing with the right side of the screen. It's a little bit more complicated there. If x position is, and this is one of the things that's annoying. Um, about stencil, that I, I maybe it's possible. I haven't figured out. I haven't figured out how to just change a, uh, a comparison. I, a, I always have to um, basically remake that block. If x itself is greater than, and here's the here's the um, now here's the little quirk of stencil for your actors. Their position is always the upper left hand corner. Um, no matter where you set the center of, of your guy, that position will always be the upper left hand. I don't know why. Um, maybe it, I, I just haven't found a way to change it, and, I, and I've just been living with it. Um, let's see, x of is greater than. Now we want to prevent him from going outside the right side of the screen, so we need to get the right side of the screen. 
and that's in this palette, that's the uh, scene. So let's go to the world. So if it's greater than the scene width, minus is current width, because we don't want any part of them to go off the screen. And this is how you build the code in these blocks. Let's minus actor width of self. And I'm going to set it to so yeah, this this the visual editor once you get once you're doing any bigger blocks, it gets very quirky in, in the positioning of them. And I'll show you a couple of really, really big blocks that I, that I put together that I had to really fiddle with it to get it to work. And it, it, it was almost enough to make me want to drop down to write code, almost. All right, so that should prevent him from going off the screen. Screen it, yeah. Okay, so let's try it. Yep, this side's right. This side's right. So now let's give him a goal. And we're going to make a new actor. We're going to call it exit. Create. And it's going to have an appearance. Okay, it's going to be blue. Okay, then we get our game. Get the scene. Take our exit, and let's put it down here, okay? All right, so there's our exit. Oops, I pushed him. Where'd the exit go? Um, the reason is because I didn't turn off the collision for the exit. Um, so now it's affected by physics. Now I can push that exit around. Um, so I'm going to go to my exit, and I'm going to sense collision as a sensor. And so now it just detects collision, but it doesn't. Um, it's not affected by physics. So let's test that to make sure. Oops. It's still affected by gravity, though. OK. No, can I rotate? OK, great. Yep, OK, so now it's a sensor, it does nothing. Um, So, first thing we want to do is um, make a new scene where we're going to win the game. So, we're going to make a new scene. Uh, win. Let's do... I don't know why the only options are uh, vertical gradient. Why don't, can I get a horizontal gradient? It's the engine. Don't know. Let's do green to a slightly lighter green. That's too harsh. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's our winning scene. Um, and then we want some text on it. Uh, so we need to create a font. So this has burned me before. You can change the character set to only letters and numbers, only numbers. Um, I tried to use numbers and set that at only letters, and I couldn't figure out why nothing was printing the screen. So now I just leave it everything. Um, let's make it, make it big. So here is one thing that I have learned. Um, you almost always want to use outline fonts because those are readable on any background. If you have a font that's a solid color, then some backgrounds will make it disappear. The more complicated your background, the more 
you need to use outline for it. So let's make it an outline of weight. Okay, that's pretty readable enough. Okay, so now it's going to take a while to save because um, the, I assume that the fonts are saved as vectors. Um, and so what the, it's doing when you create a font is it's making um, raster graphics of each font. Uh, you guys know the difference between vector and raster graphics? Anyone know? No? No? Okay. So um, raster graphics, uh, each pixel is in the graphics file. Vector graphics is the um, each pixel in the color. This is real simplification because I don't know that much about it. Um, in a vector graphic, the it's like code to draw a shape. Uh, that's the basic idea. So that vector graphic can scale to any size. Raster graphics are um, when they scale, you have to add or remove pixels. Mm -hmm. So they'll be um, they they'll change. Whereas vector graphics look the same no matter what zoom level you have. Um, fonts are usually saved as vectors so that they can scale. But rendering vectors is tends to be expensive, and so in a lot of game engines, um, will only let you render uh, raster fonts. And so what it's doing, what I assume it's doing, is that it's taking every single character that you set in the char character set, and it's making a uh, raster. It, it's it's making a raster at that size. So you see that for the font, I select the size, and so it's making a a raster font out of it. What I don't know how to do is I don't know how to load other fonts other than the defaults that that stencil comes with because um, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, but I, I'm sure there's a way to do it. They so can pick custom fonts. Okay, so I have our font, and be, before you can draw anything on the screen, you need the font. So let's go to the win, and now we're going to use we're, we're actually going to use a. Um, an event directly on the scene. This isn't going to be a behavior, but there's no variables that we need to access. So we don't need to put in a behavior. And then we'll add event, and then this is going to be a drawing event. So when drawing, then we go to our drawing tab. So the first thing we're going to do is set the font style. style, style. Current font to okay, give me font right. Text you win uh, exclamation. Okay, we win. And so then we need to add behavior to our uh, exit. So we're going to add a new behavior called, oops, sorry. We make behaviors from the uh, dashboard. So we're going to add a scene behavior. Um, so the, the two different types of behaviors are the actor behavior and the scene behavior. One's attached to actors, one's attached to scenes. They're separated just to make it easy to organize them. All right, so let's, let's add a scene behavior. We're going to call it win game. I should believe that. We're going to make that an actor behavior. Win. First thing we're going to do is attach that to our exit. Okay. And we're going to add the event that when we collide with some
and then I'm changing the uh, game logic here. Scene game flow. Fade out for 0.1 seconds. Oops. Switch to the scene, win, and fade in. Yeah, we win. Okay. So, that's technically a game. <laughs> um, we can do other stuff like add, we can add the enemies, we can add the jumping, we can add the shooting. What are you guys interested in? <laughs> Questions? Um, oh, let me go over a little bit more about stencil. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things about stencil. Uh, one is. This thing called the stencil forge, and it there's let's see behavior. It's just a whole bunch of code, um, projects, assets that people have uploaded that you have access to in Engine. Um, I I did uh, one of the first things that I did for the metal detector game is is I, I, I had a behavior that I, I couldn't find a behavior that would let a guy move one tile at a time. I just couldn't find it. So I did uh, I think I called it grid snap. Yeah, there it is. So I uploaded um, So I upload this behavior that um, you have an actor, he'll only move one tile at a time. And I can show you the code in there. And so now anyone who needs to move only one tile at a time, search for grid stat, find this, and use it in their game. Um, and so, and so that, 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 that resource is, is excellent um, to have, especially when you're first starting out. Um, let's see. The other thing that Stencil has that's great is the Stencil Arcade. So you can take your game, publish it to the arcade, just anything. I can publish this thing too. Um, and it'll just give a place to that you can link people to to have them play your stuff. It's just a very easy way to host things. Um, the free version of Stencil uh, compiles to Flash. Um, if you want to compile as a standalone desktop application or for mobile, you need to pay, it's I think $100 for a year license, which is very reasonable for something like this. Um, as compared to the pro version of Unity, which is I think $500 for an indie license. Um, I think Unreal, uh, Unreal Development Kit 4 has now a subscription license that's uh, Ten dollars a month, I think. I, I, I know. I know. With four, it's a subscription now. With with three, you can buy it outright. Um, three actually had a very generous uh, licensing um, scheme. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, so stencil. Stencil also is a very good community. Um, the the forums are very helpful. They'll answer new questions. Uh, Unity also has a huge community, and um, one of the things about the Unity community is that hey, they have kind of a gamified reputation, um, Stack Overflow-ish question and answer system. So that means that people answer e even your, your, you know, is it put in new questions because they, they're karma horn and that's, that's fine uh, because it gets questions answered. So, that's really about it. I mean, that's that's something that this is something that anyone can do. There's no magic involved. There's no special skills. I don't have that specialized skills. It's just that I've been doing it for two years. And someone who's starting out won't take you know 20 minutes to do this. I'll take three hours to do this. Um, and that's it. It's just everything else is experience. And then and then if you want to go further and make more complicated stuff, that's you start out with something small like that. Add something to it. Add something to it. Add something to it. Until finally, it's 
the thing that you were dreaming about earlier, or closer to it, at least. Okay? You guys, any questions? Extensible. Uh, you have the their kind of coding system. Is it extensible via like JavaScript or C sharp? Um, the back end is Hacks, I believe. With the last uh, Stencil update, they switched from ActionScript to Hacks. H A H A X E. Huh. I don't know anything about it. Then <laughs> Hacks, you know that's. Oh yeah, it's a really interesting uh, cross-platform language. Uh, the idea is that you write in one programming language and it can execute on uh, oh, all kinds platforms. of different platforms. Yeah, Windows, uh, mobile, uh, it targets the JVM, you can make native for d different platforms. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. Is, is that accessible and editable? Like, uh, can mm -hmm. I be Yes, yes. Yeah. You can, so there's two ways to do it. Um, you can write a behavior entirely in, so if you notice when I make a new behavior, let's see. <clears throat> Get a new behavior, so I'm going to write it in a code mode. Oh, interesting. Okay, my code. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So there's, so you drop right into code. You don't have to use the visual editor. Um, I look at code all day, and I'm sick of it. Are you familiar with Scala? It's very similar to Scala. Scala is a another language that targets the JVM. So. Interesting. Um, there's also extensions. There's there's some extensions that come with it, and I believe there's an extension API. Oh, cool. um, that's something that you'll have to look at on the forums if, if you're interested in doing that. Um, the 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 developer there's one full time developer on, on it, and he's he's been pretty accessible on there. There's a lot of like high level users that are usually pretty helpful. Um, let's see. So that yeah, so that. Um, so, and in addition, in the visual part, if you want to do something complicated, you can actually drop a block in and just put code in that block. Oh, like a blank. Yeah. Because it's interesting. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. Um, let me bring up a YouTube vid that I'll always uh, like. So, so some people, one of one of the things that that some people complain about is that Sense isn't, isn't a serious game engine or whatever, and. One, one that's bollocks because it, it's it's whatever you put into it is what it is. It doesn't matter what the engine is. But the um, let's see. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Try it again. There. There won't be any sound, but I mean, no, the screen. Can I move the screen? There we go. Okay, there won't, there won't be any sound, but I mean, this will show the kind of environment you can make with this thing that does thing. There you go. He's doing something. It just it just got greenlit on Steam. Um, I'm. It, it's super inspirational to, to to see something like this made in in, in that engine. So it's it's it, it's inspired by a, um, Metroid with Dark Souls ish atmosphere and sensibilities is what they're trying to do. I mean, that looks pretty darn good to me. That that's with stencil. That's with stencil. Yeah. So there, there's some gameplay examples later. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's mind-blowing to me. So that's just like your uh, little brown block. Exactly. <laughs> One step away, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then I mean, the, the way that he did all, all the lighting and all, all the, um, the atmosphere effects, and that, that's all just amazing. That's, that's something that, that that a lot of people thought couldn't be done with the engine. That's that's why it's just really so it doesn't have it doesn't have a built-in lighting system. Um, you have to do all that, all that. You have to do everything in shaders. I don't know anything about shaders. That's over my head. Um, for the catapult game, 
I actually had to do, I actually had to write in chairs for, to make, because one of the things that I wanted to do was that when the puck was behind the bricks, in between the bricks and the camera, one of the things that I always hate about 3D games is the camera is always, always getting behind something. And so what I did was I wrote a, um, I wrote, a, I wrote a little engine. So there's actually some really good voice here too, which I, I don't know. Um, but just search it, search on YouTube, Ghost Song. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's just a really inspirational uh, so yeah, let's let me, um, let me save this game. Let me open up uh, this game. Let's save. So yeah, this is the latest um, thing, that, thing that I'm working on. Okay. Uh, it's slowing down here. I guess my computer's doing too much stuff. So you can see, the zombies don't attack you directly, but instead they kind of wander around you. But, you're always sort of at the center of their uh, swarm here. And the way that you attack them is you dash. So then I'm dashing time stopped. And it's going to start up again. And now all of them fly off. Now, for some reason, the animations are messed up. So you see, I, I, I hit them, and now they all fly off at the same time when the timer starts again. So that's, that's just a little project that I've done. That was my last one. Okay, well, that's. So is that the only level of it? That's the only level. <laughs> That's, I, was, I was, it took me a while to figure out exactly how to make the, the proof of concept, the, the timing, the, the time stop. I, I wasn't sure, how, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it. Right? And, and so that's, that's something that, um, but now that I did it, I, I can, I can ask if I'm planning to have it on, like, like, you guys said you didn't play Smash TV, but, um, play Binding of Isaac, anyone play that? So that one has randomly, um, that one has uh, developed designed levels, but they're randomly positioned on the map. Right. And so that, that's what I'm planning. And the idea is that um, you're going to have some different tools that move around the enemies. Like instead of just dashing in them, you're going to have a grenade that you throw that blows everyone up in a radius. But it doesn't actually kill them, it just makes them fly off. And the levels will have different goals, like, um, uh, like, you want to, well, some will have straightforward, like you kill 100 enemies. Um, some will have goals that you want to, you have to bounce enemies off all four walls within, you know, 10 seconds. Um, so so it's, diff it's different, and the enemies will just keep coming until you achieve the goal or you die. It sounds like it takes more time to figure out, like, what the enemy behavior is and the game There's strategy than actually the game. There's a lot of design in it. Um, it depends on depends on what you're making. Um, I, I've after I've been doing this for a while, I like the stuff that's easy to make and, and fun to think about. But there's other stuff like the um, like I can let me bring up Unity here. Let's see. Let me go to my, uh, okay. And my, at least for my Unity stuff, a lot of it's available on my, my GitHub if you want to see sample of code. Some of it's even decent. Um, but as you can see by my commits, I'm not very committed to uh, <laughs> making most of this stuff. Um, so let's see. What's a really good one? This one, I think I just have the code in here. I don't have the actual project. Yeah, I mean, this... So, I mean, some of this, it gets involved. And, and there's a lot of... Um, 
There's a lot, lot of stuff going on here. So that, that's, in, that's in Unity. Um, this is in C Sharp, which is the, which I've come to respect a lot more after using it. And I've also been a big fan of uh, enumerated types for pretty much everything that I can pick up. Um, so in this one, let's see. That one's pretty, that one's pretty easy. Where is the, yeah, my unit object. This one's fine. Okay, so um, in this one, so I have a, I have a dictionary of units uh, of a tactics game that have different stats, and they're stored in XML. Um, so my, my innovation here, and I don't know if it's innovation or, or lack of experience, is that I store my list of units as a um, static uh, uh, variable of the class, unit class itself, so that any unit can reference the list of units and, and get information from it. Um, so in here is, yeah, the initialized code right here. So that, that's the code that loads the XML and then, and then fills out the, all of the unit objects. And then when a unit is instantiated, that information goes to the unit instance. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, some of it's more involved. It's just that after, after, after doing this and then going to doing the fun stuff, it's hard to go back to doing this because this is a lot like work. So, <laughs> try, trying to avoid work. Do, do enough work. Um, here is... And this is the class, yeah, here it is. So that's the, um, that's not interesting. Move attack. Okay, those are the subclasses. I'm trying to find something that's actually interesting. This is boring. Uh, You just have the unit script. Is that just attached to? That's attached yeah. to each object. Yeah. Each object. Or no, I'm sorry. The un unit script is a standalone um, script, and then each unit has their own. Let's see. I guess I, I, I can I can bring up a unit just to show you what it, what it is. Okay. This is catapult. Yeah, I, I went even as far as to uh, separate out the strings so that they could potentially be localized in other languages. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know anything about 3D, so it never looks good. Uh, Show you the game itself. Okay. So yeah, Uni Unity. You have to select which scene that you're on first. It doesn't have a default scene, or it won't. It won't go to default scene by default. Story, which I wrote a lot of text. There's a tutorial, which is the tutorial, it's another wall of text. Um, there one, me, two, 
to you. Okay. That's the other fun thing, that, that text uh, scrolling. So this one has a um, randomly generated map. It has 10 points on the map, which are obstacles. And then if the obstacles are next to each other, it creates objects to fill them in so that it looks kind of coherent. Um, so that guy, let's see, he's the arachnid fester. And he has the stats that he's anchored because that is the, uh, which side of it? It's used turn. That's the biography of his avatar, and he has the uh, prevents units from being disrupted. Let's move here. Okay. I'm going to pick a card, energy. I'm going to add the Oops. So it adds his energy. This turn, and that guy's turn. Move here. Can he attack at all? He can do a swarm laser. But he has very short range on that attack. Alright. And I believe that guy's only attack is melee. All his icons are stolen from game icons that net. So he plays the card, he gets a buff, a damage multiplier, and you can see it in his in his stat block. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I just couldn't figure out how to make the game fun to play after putting a lot of work into it. So I need, I need, I need a designer. I'm, I'm fine with making stuff. I'm not really good at thinking about stuff. You, you mentioned earlier about um, unnecessary difficulty. Yeah. And you know, that's kind of like the definition of what a game is. So it's just, uh, if you think, if you stop and think about like a game of golf, mm -hmm. really what golf is, you just put a ball in a hole. What makes it challenging and fun is that the hole is really far away. You have to use this stick to get into the hole. Well, it, it's that's where you put that into your game, not into making your game. <laughs> that's um, so yeah. But the first thing when you make it when you make your golf game is the first thing is you'd you'd make your field and you'd make your um, you'd make your ball and you manually put it just you make it so that it starts above the hole. And then you let it fall in the hole, and then that does that. Okay, great. Now you start further away, and then you have a way to move it. And so each step is incremental. You don't start off at the very beginning and yeah, and, and expect to do it on the first first crack. Um, so let's see. What's interesting? I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of actual interesting code here. It's actually very straightforward. So this, this is the code that uh, So that, that's the code that displays that pop-up text. So each unit has a um, each unit has a pop-up text queue and then um, and then when other objects uh, want it to display pop-up text, they, they, they send it a, they add a pop-up text object to that queue. And that pop-up text has its, its color, its text, um, mo mostly its text and its, and its color. And then every, 
I guess am I doing it every update? I think I'm doing it every update. So Unity has um, many updates. Um, one of the updates is on the GUI uh, layer. I don't know why it's on there instead of. Um, but what, so now there's three processes that are called every update. One is start pop-up text. Um, it checks all of the pop-up text in the queue. If it finds one that isn't started, then it starts it up. Um, if others are animating already, then it animates them more. Um, and then if any are finished, then it kills them. It removes them from the queue. Split pop up. So in addition to the updating on the GUI, does it also update once per frame? Uh, no. No, there's there's they're separate. Separate things. Yeah, they're, they're the GUI updates and the frame updates are separate. And they can and they can go different routes. Yeah, Unity is it is involved. That's the best way I'll describe it. Um, and so this is what their pop application. This is a good one. Um, camera uh, world to screen point, which translates a three D point in the in the game world to a position on the on the camera on, on the screen space. And because um, because GUI objects are 2D, so they're on the plane of the camera, and world objects are 3D, they're in the world space. So you need, if you want to show something on the camera where that, that always appears above a guy, you need to know where he's in the world space and how that translates to the camera space. So that, that's, an, that's an interesting thing. Um, I mean, all, all this code is fairly straightforward, and I, it appears that I even commented most of it, amazingly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's none, of, none of it's too complicated, but taken together, it, it really it, it adds up. And, and you get to one part where you go back and say, what the hell was I thinking making this? I guess this was every, every project. Um, so that's, OK, that, that, that's pretty much it. I can't really think of anything else to go over. Any questions? All right, well, I guess, guess we're done. Cool. So, um, let's see. Yeah, that's it. What's your day job? Day job. Um, computer stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I, I am the uh, support manager for Antenna House for the U.S. and everything outside of Asia, basically. Oh. And it's a company that um, makes publishing products. Um, in our, the main product is called um, Antenna House Formatter, which is an XSLFO rendering engine. Have you ever heard of XSLFO? No. Well, it's the language um, for paginated documents that's the equivalent of um, HTML for um, screen documents. So paginated documents have uh, physical dimensions, and they have references back and forth in them. Um, and they have things like indices and tables of contents and hyphenation and all that stuff. And so that, that's a language that's made for paginated documents. And so the, that's the engine that everyone uses for it. And so if you have a, um, a Chrysler, in the manual in the glove box, it's probably made in our software. And um, your tax forms for the last, I think, two years now are made in our software. So yeah, that's my, that's my day job is I answer customers' questions. Mine's a bug developer, like doing WordPress development and stuff, ah. but this is more, it's going to be more fun. It depends on your definition. <laughs> it, it's more interesting to talk about, but uh, I, I know if actually doing it is more fun. Right. I don't know. Yeah. It, 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 and it is, though. It, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's needs to be part of a big project, but it's, it's also daunting, too, because there's, there's just so many moving parts to it mm -hmm. that. And, and I can see, that I, I know that, that I'm not going to ever have the interest to be good at the art side, and yet you need the art side to make an interesting product. 
no matter how interesting your mechanics are, you need some kind of visual design that make well, it compelling. Or you make bad art part of your Minecraft. Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's it's it's. I wouldn't say it's good. I wouldn't say it's bad. No, it's not bad. But it's, it's, make the roughness of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then you need someone else to like right. do that part. I'm in the same problem where like I want to do everything myself, but it's like who would I work with? And, right. You know. And and I've been looking online for collaborating. Like, there's not really many open source game projects that. There, there just aren't any. Game, game development really doesn't lend itself to open source that well. The Uni I've had good experience with the Unity forums. There are lots of just teams of people working. Okay. They're usually loose, but yeah. uh, I don't know if it's I, 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 look, I looked around there and it didn't... Yeah. I, I, at least when I was looking there, I didn't see it. And that's, um, yeah, I've been trying to uh, group on another forum. I've been trying to wrangle into actually making something. It's tough. So what what are what what games do you guys like? What games do you play? I'm usually not talking about games. No. <laughs> I like to be good at them when I play. Okay. I'm not talking to get good. Good enough. Oh, I want to play my sneak in StarCraft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I set a timer. Greedy <laughs> <laughs> makes me sick. I do ah. not get seasick on the sneak. I got C6 playing Spear of the Dragon. Oh. <laughs> I agree. Like, I would, like the, the time that it takes to, to play games, I would rather be making the game. But then, at the same time, it's like, I don't have any ideas to make the game. So I have been playing these games. Yeah, you need research to spend months playing the game. So just read Polygon and wishful thinking. Watch, watch other people. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, Game of Sutra. Right. Are, that, 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 that's a really good site for the business and, and, the, and the kind of the philosophy of game making. Okay. Yeah. Um, Gamedev.net, I think they have a lot of, lot of information on that site there. Okay. What was the game? Gamedev.net. I'm sure there are some good podcasts too. I know that for game yeah. audio, there are a lot. I'm sure there are for development. Sure yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you go to YouTube, type, look at tutorials. I, I can't stand video tutorials, honestly. Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, I, I, I like written stuff, you know, that you can read at your leisure and copy and paste code out of, as opposed to most of the YouTube stuff, which you. Which some some of them are actually really good. They actually have to like, go to the site to get the code that I'm using right now, but very few. Maybe a split screen would be a good thing, because I I try to get end users to read manuals, mm -hmm. and I try to make them really short, and they still don't want to read manuals. And yeah, nobody wants to read. Still want to watch a video, so maybe you know you can cut a paste here, but here's the video. <laughs> I'll drone at you. Yeah. Oh, oh right. Oh, game design documents. That's one thing that I didn't go over. Um, Go to my. I believe Catapult might even have one. I did not go over. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. All right, so I, I stole a template from somewhere, and this is a very basic uh, game design document for the Catapult game. So, intro, gameplay, um, style, any components. This is the, the big part is the assets. Um, for a, a real game, this will be 20 pages of stuff. Um, and 
And then let's see. So this is the looks like it didn't like my font here, but this was a kind of a flow for the game. Some some people use flow charts. Um, you don't do storyboarding or anything like that. Um, I I haven't done it just because I feel like I I, I just haven't done it. Um, so that was my timetable here. And then let's see. And, there's, and this is this is the game primer too. So this actually is my final one. I actually do have multi pump teams. Um, what I what I never added. What I wanted to do with with the catapult game was um, was the. Well, if I, if I could get the physics working, and I never got the physics working, and so that, that kind of game depends so much on this physics being really tight. Um, but the idea was that you're working to crush this castle, um, and then there's little AI workers going to build it up again. And you can hit those with your pop too and send them flying. And, and, uh, but I, I never got that far just because I couldn't get, I couldn't get the physics to work I want. And it, it appears to be an issue with Unity, at least it was before. Um, I made a simple test project where I just tried to stack. I tried just try to see how high I could get a stack of boxes without it falling falling over, with no forces at all. And um, unless they were uh, unless they were movement constrained in the x and z direction, you couldn't get a stack of more than ten boxes, no matter how inert you made the material. And that, that just felt like an issue with Unity. And apparently, I'm not the only one who has that. I can't think of too many, too many games that have lots of stacked objects that you can interact with with physics. Um, would, be, would there be an easier way to make one big destructible object? There are ways to do that. Um, one, of, one of the major ways that people do that kind of thing is that they sleep everything until it's interacting with. Mm -hmm. um, but that leads to some, that leads to very unnatural interactions. Um, and, and, and for something like, like a big wall that you want to break, you want one block hitting it to affect the other blocks, but you don't want them to divide right apart, and you don't want them to constantly jitter. You want, you want them to come to rest, and no matter how I set the... I, I couldn't figure it out. No matter how I set this, the materials, and no matter how I set the uh, dampening, they, I never could get them to rest. But that's, that's, I believe it's possible, and I think it's just that I don't know enough about the physics, how the physics works mm -hmm. to make it happen. I believe you can do something like flexible joints. I think you, you can add a joint to the block where, um, so joints let you let your objects move um, with each other, but if a, more than a certain amount of force is applied, then they break. So, um, and then the fixed joints as your objects move, stay and stay together, like, like a glue, but more than an amount of force applied, they break apart. So it might be possible to do it that way. There's a lot of things to do. But it was late enough in the project that I was getting bored with it, I switched to something else. But yes, yeah, so game design document, but it really does help though. And when I, when I do bother to make game design document, it really helps me stay on task and, and focus on getting the, um, the next piece done. Did you mess with uh, creating your own engine at all? Like, using no. DirectX APIs or anything like that? Yeah. It seems like a whole thing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it, there was a couple things that I looked at. The um, There was a, a free version of Game Maker that just one disgruntled guy made. Um, and and he, he was just tired of the direction that the company was taking the game engine. And, and so he you know, made a new version of it. But I, I don't know how far along that is. Um, I think for the raw game making in the nineties I tried to mess with the NetHack code. And anyone here ever played NetHack? No? Yeah. NetHack. Okay. Um, it is forty-five megabytes of complete spaghetti C code. It's uh, unreadable, um, there there's everything is in hard coded arrays. Um, where the size of the array, uh, everything, nothing's a reference, everything's a hard code, so any little change that you make, you have to manually propagate through a hundred different files. Um, it's just, I, I don't see how people work with it, and yet they do. 
and um, yeah, so I, I, in, in some ancient version of NetHack in the 90s, I have like a credit in there because I sent in one patch to somebody, which they probably didn't use because they had compiled the but, but yeah, um, I, I, I like the visual development, it's just, it's just more fun. Yeah. And, it, and, and other people can watch you do it too. But yeah, I, of the engines that I play with, I like, I like Stencil the best. Just because it's the most distilled experience of of an idea, and then you make it real, and everything else seems to have barriers in between doing that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.